I run a, an apparel line called Royal Dynamite. My dream is to build it into an impactful household brand, just looking to scale. I mean, and me and you have talked about this in the past and looking to activate um, one of the biggest marketing things of today, which is um, influencer um, collaborations. And also, I think ultimately my, my goal in life and, oh, oh, well, I don't want to make it sound so whatever, but it's to build wealth and wealth that benefits, like I say, my family, my community, my friends and, and everyone around me. But one of the ways I want to be able to do that is to build wealth through investments such as real estate. I, There's I a difference between a dream chaser and a dream catcher. Thanks all for tuning in to Dream Catchers, where we make things happen. Dreamcatchers was formally launched to unlock the hidden potential in successful, self-motivated individuals who desire to take their life's work to the next level but need support to evolve. We are a collective group of professionals with various backgrounds that use our talents to assist those individuals in realizing their wildest dreams by providing education, inspiration, and direction. This podcast is where we share the lessons we've learned along the way to catching our dreams and give you some context around the how and the why to each approach to put you further ahead on the journey to catching your dreams. Are you ready? Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Dreamcatchers podcast. I'm your host, Jerome. <laughs> you guys are in for a treat. Got my man, Cecil Williams, in from the A by way of Sierra Leone. Look. Buckle up, buckaroos. It's about to go down. Cecil, how are you, my friend? I'm doing good, Jerome. How about yourself? Man, I'm amazing. I get to spend some time with you today. We've been on this wild ride. And uh, most people don't know a whole lot about you because this is your first podcast, man. So grateful for you taking the chance to come hang out with me and to share with the Dreamcatchers tribe, man. So do the listeners a favor before we dive in. How can they get in contact with you after the show? To get in contact with me, um, easiest way, uh, socials. I'm on LinkedIn. You can search Cecil Williams on LinkedIn or on Instagram. Uh, you could search See Me Fly, which is C-I-M-I-F-L-Y-R-D. So they both have stuff to do with the brands I represent or founded. So See Me Fly, C-I-M-I-F-L-Y-R-D and Everything social is has something to do with see me fly. So just search see me fly, you'll find. Okay, so you you throwing the brands out there already. Let's let's dive in. What is see me fly? What is RD? Like what's going on? Who are you? What do you do? So, um, like you mentioned, my name is Cecil Williams. I I live in Atlanta, Georgia. I was born in um, Sierra Leone, West Africa, and um, immigrated to the United States when I was eighteen. Uh, went to high school in another country called the Gambia and um, moved 6,000 miles away from my parents, my family. They thought I was crazy, but I think it was um, a period of growth for me. I kind of wanted to figure out how to do it by myself because I'd never been away from family before. Um, how See Me Fly as a name and what's becoming a brand now evolved was it's probably 16, 17. Um, getting exposed to the internet a lot. Um, then most people had Yahoo email um, accounts and I had to create my Yahoo. And I had listened to a song originally from KRS-One and I'm listening to the song and he says the word see me fly, but then when he spells it, he says C-I-M-I-F-L-Y. And I'm like, that's different, wrote it down. So then I made my email see me fly yahoo.com. And um, same song again, or same word was actually repeated by Diddy and Mason, one of their songs, and they spelt it the same way. So it was a popular culture rap um, thing. And fast forward to today, as I was building, trying to figure out what my brands will be and all that stuff, my friends would always say, well, you've stuck with the name See Me Fly since we knew you since you were a kid. It's an easy thing. It's an easy branding name. So wet with See Me Fly for my, what you would call umbrella of companies. And we'll talk about that later. But then Royal Dynamite is a t-shirt brand, apparel brand that I co-founded 10 years ago in 2010 with a friend of mine when I lived in Los Angeles. 
And essentially what it is, is we call creative style for awareness. I mean, I'm wearing one of the t-shirts and it says Freetown, which is the capital city of Sierra Leone, where I'm from. And essentially we partner with influencers, brands, artists, graphic artists, and all those people. We basically put the pieces together to create merchandise, t-shirts, hats, and stuff like that. And a portion of the proceeds we've always put aside to give back through our RD Cares um, component of it, which is kind of giving back to kids in un underserved areas in, with education and now one of my passions, entrepreneurship. So, yeah. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So you were like uh, Tom's shoes before Tom's shoes existed. <laughs> yeah, trying to do my part in giving back to the world and giving back to the community. Wow. So you said you guys partner with influencers. Can you talk about any of those partnerships? Like anything, anybody I would know? In the past, we've done some major stuff with some influencers. The biggest name probably anybody would ever recognize is Issa Rae. Um, we did something with her in the past when um, her career was taking off and she used to do the Awkward Black Girl series on YouTube. And we actually did two things. We hosted her I'm Awkward t-shirts on our website. And then we also did a Crown Me Awkward um, t-shirt design contest with her. And um, that's one of the people we've partnered with. We've partnered with a few other people in the past. Um, Lovey, who's also someone, she calls herself a professional troublemaker and she's doing a good job at doing that. So we partnered up with her in the past when she had um, something called the Red Pump Project and um, just a few other people. So the goal is we're looking to now partner with more people in exciting ways. And we have a bunch of um, things planned with that. Wow. Okay. And so you talked about 10 years, you know, you've been doing the apparel company been working on the see me fly brands but did you ever have like a w2 were you in corporate or 1099 or anything oh yeah i did um so i graduated college in 2006 um and uh when i when i graduated i went into recruiting uh, i got my business i got a business degree and uh, with a concentration in inf uh, information systems didn't want to kind of go the geeky computer route um, didn't think it was, I didn't think it was interesting enough. Um, maybe now I'd have second thoughts on that, but no regrets. And went into recruiting, a little bit of a te technical recruiting role and did that for about four years. And then the bubble burst. So you can imagine people are losing jobs. And here we are trying to recruit people for jobs. Just wasn't making any sense. Didn't, it, it just didn't work out. So got laid off from that. And then maybe shortly after, well, not necessarily shortly after, as everybody knows around that time, 2008, 2009, 10, um, jobs were difficult to come by. But lucky me, um, I was able to get a job at the workforce development in Long Beach where I lived. And we were then helping people find jobs. So during o um, Obama's era, he was giving, I guess you could call it stimulus money to the states, California got a huge chunk of it, and we were putting people back to work. And then after that, went into kind of then went into, I guess, IT related stuff where for about seven, eight years, did some consulting in healthcare informatics. So traveling to different hospitals and getting them up on their EMR health um, systems um, and stuff like that. So basically, the systems they use um, to kind of um, intake and all that stuff with patients so yes did have a w2 and had it for quite some time and i guess that kind of always made me go in and out with royal dynamite because um as people say you're trying to break free from the golden handcuffs and if you're making decent money good money then um you you use it to subsidize starting your business but at the same time there's that trying to navigate and figure out your way. So I was always in and out while RD and See Me Fly were kind of like the side hustles. Got it. So you turn the side hustle into the main hustle, right? Yes. That's crazy. So, you know, from time to time, you'll bring up Family Man building a brand. And you haven't talked about the wife or your little one yet. So how does all of this kind of fit together with leaving corporate, 
getting married, having a little one, making your side hustle the main hustle. Let's talk about the family man building a brand. Yeah, so the family man building a brand is uh, an idea we've been floating around and we're still working on bringing it to reality in terms of putting it on a platform, but that's my life. I mean, that's the life I live. That's the life a lot of people live every day. And it's interesting because I like to call it family man building a brand in the sense that I'm juggling being a husband, being a father, and being an entrepreneur. And I put it in that order because I think if I get that order right, then it works and not necessarily trying to put entrepreneurship over family or or vice versa, whatever the case. But essentially every day, my life, seven days a week, literally is waking up, being the best husband I could be. But then my wife and I have a handsome two-year-old son and having I spend a lot of time with him taking him to daycare and picking him up from daycare just bonding and and doing all that stuff while doing all that in between time when he's not around his mom's at work I have to be an entrepreneur I have to be a business owner I have to figure out um running RD which is I I like to call it my nine to five essentially i mean obviously it's my business and i do what's necessary to take it to the next level and then um also working on um see me fly so what see me fly has evolved into is um i i write on and i and i post my 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 blogs on medium so see me fly money and um essentially that kind of stemmed from the early days when i we we talk about going back to me being laid off from recruiting and I had to figure out how to survive. Now here I'm a young, relatively still young kid, 25 years old, being laid off for the first time, didn't know how to navigate life, didn't, couldn't fall back on mom and dad or whatever. I mean, you're seeing as an adult, young adult, you had to figure it out. So after figuring that part out, I kind of built some habits with money and see me fly money is that. I'm just sharing the experiences that I've gone, that I've had over the years um, um, with that. So that's kind of what the family man building a brand. So my goal is to share how I, I kind of juggle all of that. And eventually, one of the things I want to do with that is to get other people to tell their stories, because I think too often we hear the stories of either people exclusively in their professional lives, or we hear of people exclusively in their home or personal lives and never the two as to how people mi- co-mingle the two to, to, to still figure out the struggles and become successful. Yeah, that part is really interesting, right? Because everybody wants to give you a highlight reel, but there's so much more that goes into it and when you're actually executing. And I think a lot of us, we want to emulate the result, but we don't actually see the process to get to the result. And that's what you're trying to pull out for Phil's, right? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, I think you want people to be able to see, at least you kind of want to pull the hood and let people see what's under the hood. I mean, if you take, for car enthusiasts, obviously, if you're a car enthusiast, you don't just care about what the Ferrari looks like. And I mean, that's what everybody sees, how it drives. But car enthusiasts want to pull and see what's underneath the hood, the the V12 engine and, and the chassis and all that stuff. So essentially, that's what I'm trying to do with entrepreneurship or just people's lives. And it's not necessarily you having to be a business owner. You could be anything else. You could be a doctor. You could be um, a scientist. I mean, there's still, everyone's juggling family life. It doesn't have to be married. You could be with your parents, with your siblings or whatever. We're all juggling that and, and trying to make it in life. Love it. So before you left corporate, was that when you actually left, was that the first time that you were thinking I need to be doing something on my own? Or did you resist it and you're like, ah, I'm making too much in here. I'm just going to keep it just a little bit longer and keep kind of dragging it out. I I, I had to drag it out many a times. I mean, I think before when I finally decided to leave, I guess if I put present day, I had to make sure certain things were in place financially um, with my wife being more stable with her career and obviously the the major driving decision having a son but before 
I left many a times. I always try to just quit, but um, I guess you can kind of say being young and reckless, you try to quit, you try to do things. I mean, I've tried it a few times, you bootstrap, you save up, and then you realize I didn't save enough money and I'm not gaining enough traction with this business. And not that you will, lucky for me, I can also, I never gave up on, on that. I just had to go back and going back always for me was to go get more money. So I became disconnected sometimes from what I did, but I always had the work ethic to make sure I showed up to work every day. So I had that going for me and lucky enough for me, I wouldn't say I got fired because, oh, he's lazy, but it then became just about money and the passion for giving it all to corporate just wasn't there. So um, yeah, and now was just the right time for me to be able to do that where everything started um, to fall in place. Got it. So who showed up to help you out along the way so that you could kind of go on this journey? You, Jerome, um, you've played a huge, I mean, seriously, like uh, I always say I have, I've had internet mentors or coaches or whatever you want to call it. One of my biggest internet coaches, mentors has been Gary Vornachuk, Gary V. Followed him from when he started publishing his books, reading his stuff. And sometimes you you get so inspired and motivated by what he's doing and you're seeing him scale and you're saying, how do I do this? And there's a, there, there was a disconnect. Maybe that disconnect was because not having access to, again, going to pulling the hood. I mean, yes, he's very open and he tells you everything he does, but now to gain an insight into someone explaining to you, or, I mean, he forces people to take action, but there's a disconnect between giving the information and then, taking action that's kind of where that that bridge and I think that's where you come in and help me a lot with that being able to coaching sessions mentoring and saying how do we build a mindset to 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 connect and build a bridge and that's what we're building now and that's essential to actually have someone who is doing the things you want to do or going in that same direction but is way ahead of you and saying I'm going to pull you along with me and we're going to run this race. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, I didn't see that one coming, but we're going to hey, take I, it. I'm I grateful give, for it. I tell it the real way, man. No other way. Definitely. All right. So this time you're out, you're doing your thing. I'm sure that people have called and said, hey, Sasa, won't you come back in? Like, we, we got this opportunity for you. When was it that you realized, like, I'm out. I'm staying out. I call this the red pill moment. Uh, my red pill moment, I guess you kind of say it's happened a few times. Um, but yes, you still get those emails from recruiters or the jobs and they're saying, hey, come back in or you're thinking. I mean, since I was doing consulting, it's like project based. So you can literally go and say, let me just go put in a quick three weeks, two weeks and make some quick money and come back and for me, my red pill moment, I always say sounds cliche because most people, it's, it's tied to something. My, my red pill moment was tied to the birth of my son. And um, when we found out my wife was pregnant, one of the things I had to give up was traveling. I mean, because my job was very in travel intensive. I was always all over the place and I'd be spending two weeks to six weeks at a time on the road and having a son just wasn't, it just wasn't going to happen. I mean, my wife was um, in residency trying to finish. So we, I had to be present for her and eventually be present for my son. And right there and then we started making a decision and plans to make sure I was going to stay home. Now staying home meant maybe you find a job at home, which I, I did and it didn't turn out so good. So all the combination of that, my son, the nine to five now that like the, the typical nine to five where you drive into work every day after having not having done that for a while is what pushed me to say when I get out I'm never coming back in so I have to do what's necessary to make sure I don't go back to that life what's up tribe it's your host Jerome I just want to let you know that we put together a free 15 point checklist for exiting the matrix jump on over to dreamshouldbereal.com in order to pick your free copy up Let's get back to the show. <laughs> Let's talk about that life. What's that life? <laughs> I mean, and it's not to knock that life because I do believe that, um, I mean, 
unless you were born with a silver spoon or you were born into a wealthy family, will you then be born and groomed and then go into the family business or whatever that is, or just parents making a phone call and you have a job at McKinsey or whatever. I mean, I wasn't born with, with that. So, but most of us, the path is, especially as an immigrant, the path is you come to the United States, you go to college. That's really why most of us come here and all get an education, a better opportunity at life. And once you're done with that, the expectation is you get a job and you work your way up the ladder. And that's what makes your parents proud, your family proud, your community proud of you and that type of stuff. So that life essentially is just following the path, the, the path that, um, the safe path, if you may, the path where you're not rocking the boat you're not causing alarms, you're not setting off alarms with anyone and nobody's asking or nobody's in doubt. You go, you, you work, you, you make a promotion, you get a raise and everybody's happy. But does that make you the individual happy if you have other desires and dreams? No. So for me, there was always that battle of do I stay this path or do I do what I need to do? And I think my wife always knew that. So like I said, one of the people who also helped me with making that transition was her because she always knew that if I stayed that path, I would never be happy, not just with myself, but with everything around me. So we always had to, we had to sit down and figure out like, okay, let me pursue my dreams and together we will do it. And at least there'd be more freedom and, 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 and happiness in, in, in you wanting to say, I'm doing what I need to do. Obviously, there's the part where when you do what you need to do, you have to scale that with any business. But yeah, I mean, essentially, that life is just the path that most people want you to take or what society has kind of built, that system of the corporate life and having a job. And there's nothing against that. It's just that's what we, we were used to. The construct. <laughs> exactly. So what's been your worst fear in this process? Uh, my worst fear in this process, I think, um, I'd say self-limiting beliefs. I mean, the things you grow up with and you don't even, on, you don't even realize the subconscious and how it builds based on what it's been used to. And one of my greatest fears is, is you and I talk about this all the time is vulnerability, being vulnerable, being willing to open up to people completely scares me. And it's not saying I want to put my entire life and have a camera where it's following me every day and you get to see me do everything in life. Because I think with social media and all these other things, people curate their stories. They, they, you see what they want you to see. So whether that person is willing and it's their personality where they want you to see everything versus the one who just wants you to see when they're on the yacht or whatever, I mean, it is what it is. But for me, generally, vulnerability just, and I think that vulnerability comes from um, how I was raised, but also how we were raised in the communities we came from. We were raised to work hard, put your head down and just keep plowing. Like when good things happen for you, you don't need to tell the whole world. Like you just need to keep going and, tell your small group of maybe your parents, your, your siblings and that, and just keep, keep you pushing. So I, I think vulnerability kind of, it, it, it limited me from taking action. And I, I think working with you, seeing now you, your story is taking it from, okay, I'm an engineer. I worked all the way to the top and at the end of the day, it's not fulfilling what you want to do. So you have to say, okay, enough is enough. Let me take action in what I want to do. It's not gonna be easy because I think that's the mistake people think when they say, oh, well, he just wants to be a slack. He just wants to, it's not easy because now everything is in your control. Everything, you are your everything. You are the accountant. You, you are your mind coach. You are your, I mean, you have to take action with every single thing you want to do until you can get to a point where you start building the foundation and gaining enough traction to get other people to help you. And that part is what my mama always taught me. She said, you got to push your cars. And if you push your car, then other people help push the car. It's getting to that 
place where you got traction. Other people are really excited about what's going on. They can actually see the mission. They can see the vision of you actually achieving or having potential to achieve the thing instead of just throwing it away. So was there a point when everything was on the line? Um, you know what? I thought about that and I'll, I'll go back to saying this with being an immigrant. When you're an immigrant, everything is on the line always. I, and I say this because <laughs> I came here at 18. There's, the ex, there's expectations. I wasn't the kid who went to college and dropped classes just because it was convenient or my friends did it. You have to stay the course. You, everything is always on the line. I mean, you're always trying to do the right thing and you build resilience out of that. But for me, where I think everything was on the line, maybe, and I didn't even realize it was 2009, 10, when I lost my job for the first time. Now, we were a new generation coming into, this is the first time since maybe the Great Depression that our generation was experiencing something like that and not knowing how to handle it because we, you're not taught to handle things like that. And I always say, I remember, um, I mean, you, you're on unemployment, you're getting checks, um, you're young, you're not, you don't know everything about money and saving it because you weren't taught you and, and that type of stuff. And now here I am running to my last, I think maybe two, three thousand dollars of savings in my account. And I clearly remember one day sitting in my room and I'd filled out my unemployment and I'm waiting and the time was getting so close where I needed that check to be able to pay rent. And because it's like, if I don't get this money, I dip into my last three grand and pay all my bills. And then I have no more money. I have to call my parents or what am I going to tell them? Like, I mean, it was, it was a bad time. I mean, I, to me, I think that was rock bottom. I mean, in everything worked out. I did, it got approved, but I think that feeling to go day by day, you wake up every morning or you're going to bed with like what you would call nightmares, like living nightmares. And then you wake up and you're still feeling like horrible because you're thinking like this has to happen, but I can't control it. I'm not the one who gets anything approved. I know what I have and that's that. And what I have literally covers only the next month. So I think after that moment, I said to myself, I have to get better with money how I manage my money and essentially how I manage my life to never put myself in a position where I felt that way. And I didn't want to feel that way. And since then, I don't think I've ever felt that way, like fear, because that, that literally was fear, fear of the unknown fear of, I mean, yes, you have faith, you believe in God and that, and, and that he came through for me, but at the end of the day, there are man-made things we have to control. And I wanted to be in control of some of those things rather than just saying, hey, well, it's going to work out. I mean, people always say it's going to work out, but money only works itself out when you put yourself in the position to make it or even your success on your dreams only happen when you put yourself in the position to make it happen. That's big, right? Because a lot of people just sit back and wait and don't do their part. And James always asks, are you a participant or an observer? And I just smile every time. So kudos to you for taking action against the things that you could actually take action against in order to affect the result that you desire most. And so, you know, what's your biggest difference in your approach to life today versus when you were stuck in the construct? I think um, clarity. Um, having clarity about what you want to do in life is very important. And um, I got a lot of help with that. I think once you have clarity in your journey, because I always say life is a journey and most people try to take it as the end goal. This is going to sound bleak, but the end goal is death. And it's not me trying to sound depressed and depressing or anything, but we all are going to live life and we're all going to die someday. So everything else in between is just a journey. Now there's milestones which you put for yourself in that journey. And within that journey, what I'm I'm what I'm I'm getting good at is clarity, clarity of knowing what I want, and then going out and seeking the knowledge to execute on 
my goals. So I think for me, clarity has been that for me versus, I think when you're working, it's a job. You're told, it's, if you think about jobs, we go to work for two things, to make money, to survive, and obviously build a skill set. Because if you're an accountant, it's a very niched um, job. If you're a doctor, you have to understand what it takes to be a doctor. And then everything else you do out of that, outside of that is to make money to survive. So you kind of are following somebody else's system. Now, they're, it doesn't matter whether you're passionate about it or not. It's still going in a direction that is led to you by this big corporation or this big system. So um, when you choose to take the path less traveled to be an entrepreneur and a business owner, yes, there's things, skill sets you need to pick up, but you figure it out somewhat by educating yourself and knowledge and now embracing people who've taken the same path as you, but it's not, it's not easy. It's, there's no playbook where at work they'll say, okay, to get to this, these are the steps you have to do, perfect this, and this is all you're going to do for the next 10 years of your life at work, and you can climb the ladder. It doesn't work that way in entrepreneurship. <laughs> You mean it's not a straight path? Come on. That's I mean, works, right? life in itself is not a straight path. So I don't see any reason why this would be a straight path. There's, it's definitely not a straight path. I mean, you have to learn everybody else's job first for you to figure it out. And then once you figure it out, I mean, there's a lot of things in it. You have to then figure out what can I let go of and what can I delegate? And what can I afford to delegate? I mean, so there's two parts of it. I mean, we all would like to just, I mean, like any job, would like to delegate everything, but you have to have the means to delegate. You have to let your ego go and be willing to delegate to make, to move forward. And if you can't do that, then you're standing in your own way and you're not going to get where you need to get to. Get out of your own way, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. What are you most grateful for? Um... Hmm. I think oh, I'm, I'm grateful for life. I'm, I'm grateful for my family. And I'm, I, I, I said earlier, I'm grateful for clarity. I'm grateful for um, being able to just live the life, my life on my terms and not say my terms in, in a selfish way, but being in a position where I have a dream and I'm doing what it takes to live that dream. So therefore my family, my community can benefit from, from it. I love it. And so you got a shirt on and it says Freetown for the folks who aren't watching the YouTube vision, uh, version of this. What does that mean to you? <laughs> Freetown, Freetown is, so, I mean, the story about Freetown, my bad, this like, Thing messed up but freetown is the capital city of um sierra leone if you go back in the history and if you kind of look at the bridge between the diaspora freetown was one of the first places where slaves were returned to after when um slavery was ended um i guess you can kind of say in the west in the united states and and, and europe and places like that so freetown was one of the first places that they took slaves back to and it's it's a historical city. It's it's it has a lot of history, but it's a lot of history that's not being told to the world the way it's supposed to be told. And when we started the t-shirt line, I think two two years into it, we were looking for something to get people to connect with people. And I think in when you're building a consumer brand, one of the most important things. I'm learning even today and more is you have to build a connection to your audience. We make t-shirts, they come a dime a dozen, but what makes my t-shirt different from any other brand is the connection that I have to a certain group of people. And that when you activate that emotion, then you're able to get people to support you, but not just support you, build a community. And that's what Freetown is so I always give the simple example which makes it easy for everyone is I grew up in Los Angeles if you saw me wearing an LA hat it wasn't because I was a Dodgers fan I'm not I'm actually a Yankees fan so I wear a Yankee hat but if if I leave the state and I'm wearing a hat that says LA it's because it's a representation of the city that I'm from in this case Los Angeles or people leaving the United States and going abroad and wearing the NY hat mostly do it 
because they want to represent what they call a Yankee. So in, in essence, New Yorker or an American. So Freetown evoked the same emotions and was the goal was to, to get the same thing done. When you see Freetown, people, it was you, you're a representation of your city, a representation of your community, where you're from. And for people in the diaspora, it's a way to just connect back to their roots. I mean, this is becoming a huge thing where people want to know where they're from. So we were able to tell a lot of stories with this and it became a movement. And over the last eight years, it's just become this almost brand of its own. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Free town and freedom. Yep, free the town, freedom, exactly. And that's what we're all looking for. We're all striving for freedom. So Cecil, what dream are you most focused on catching next? Um, my dream right now is, as I mentioned to you guys, I run a, an apparel line called Royal Dynamite. My dream is to build it into an impactful household brand, just looking to scale. I mean, and me and you have talked about this in the past and looking to activate um, one of the biggest marketing things of today, which is um, influencer um, collaborations. And also, I think ultimately my, my goal in life and, oh, oh, well, I don't want to make it sound so whatever, but it's to build wealth and wealth that benefits, like I say, my family, my community, my friends and, and everyone around me. But one of the ways I want to be able to do that is to build wealth through investments such as real estate. I, I look at real estate. I mean, if you go even way back to me being a kid and now putting, bringing everything into context, it's the one thing that doesn't necessarily go away people build property or build homes or whatever and they pass it down i mean they pass it down to their kids their kids pa then pass it down to their kids and even if you sell it whoever's acquiring that could do the same thing and it's a good way to build wealth so ultimately one of the things that i'm really obsessed with is just unlocking the process to building wealth for myself and my family and my community wow Wow. Why is that important for you to share with other people instead of just keeping it for yourself? I mean, I think it is important to share because there's in our communities, the word wealth or the idea of it seems taboo. Nobody wants to really talk about it. So I think it's important when people like such as myself and you, um, acquire the knowledge and figure it out to be brave enough to put the information out there because other people, I mean, I learn from people like you. I learn from, I like to learn from people that I can relate to. And, and that's just most of human nature. We first, we, we like to be in our comfort zones. So we start with people that look just like us before we branch out. The more knowledge we get, the more we become emboldened, the more we become or we, we get more power or feel confident to go out and then now say, okay, I can, I can dig, I can take this from somebody else, but we wanna start within our own communities. And I think for me, as I'm gaining this knowledge, and I, like I said, going way back to 2009, waiting on that paycheck and, and all that stuff and starting to learn how to eliminate debt, how to track my expenses and all these things, I want to share that information because somebody out there is looking for it and they, they start first within their community. So if they can start with me and they build the skill sets necessary to do that, then they also build the confidence to go out there. And if more of us can tell our stories, then the more we're able to build our communities and one day get to where we're self-sufficient enough. I mean, obviously self-sufficiency doesn't mean we don't need other people to get to where we need to get to, but we can build on our, within our own communities and not always having to lean on others or other communities to get to. I mean, you can always see the Asian communities figured it out, the Jewish communities figured it out. So if we can get to that level, then, I mean, we get a seat at the table. A seat at the table, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we're seeking. Cecil, what gift are you giving the world? Um, I think the gift I'm giving to the world aligns with this podcast. You always say, and when we talk, 
dreams can be real. And I think my gift I want to give to the world and building a platform is giving people the belief that their dreams can be real. However, in order for those dreams to be real, you have to work for it. Quick story my dad always used to tell me, and this is not to offend anyone, but he always says there's, I mean, this was a long time ago as a kid, so it'd probably be like, okay, there's six, seven billion people in the world, there's one God. And he says, and this was an analogy for me to kind of understand that, hey, if you want something, you have to get it yourself. He says, now there's one God for six, seven billion people in the world. So he wakes up every morning. If he blesses you today, if he comes to your doorstep and he says, hey, today I'm blessing you and he leaves, take that blessing and manifest it and turn it into something good. Because once he leaves, he has to go to 6.9 billion people more before he comes back to you. Do you know how long that will take before he comes back to you? I mean, and when he said it, and I think of it that way, it's a story that stuck with me all the way to till today. And I always say to people, if you think of it that way, when you are blessed, make sure you embrace it and take that blessing to the next level and share it with the world. So for me, what I would like to leave in part to this world is your dreams can be real, but you have to work for it. So nourish your mind and just believe that you can do it and take action. Ooh, he's challenging you guys. You got to do the work. That's to. All right. So final question man i we snuck up on me I, I didn't tell you the four countdown we're down to the final one uh, what is the one thing you want the listeners to take away from this episode i think one of the things that i want people to take away from this is it, it goes back to that red pill moment um once you find clarity in what you want to do in your dream i think commit to it and um find a process within that journey, find a process that works. And, and when I say find a process that works, it's not saying this is an immediate thing you need to do, but you have to build a track record and you have to be consistent. If you can be, if you can find those two things, yes, there's going to be setbacks, there's going to be challenges, but once you're able to be consistent with this, just keep running your race. The pace of the race is going to change. Just don't stop running that race. Just keep going. It's a marathon, not a sprint, baby. Exactly. Got to keep running the race. Cecil, you're, you're a true example, social proof that dreams can and should be real. I think it's amazing that you travel 6,000 miles to start a new life in a new country, and you've been able to ride the highs and the lows and just grab that thing and, and make it a reality because you were willing to do the work. And for anybody out there who's questioning whether or not their dream can be a reality, I think you've just dismissed any excuse that they may have, especially for somebody who was born here as a Native American and had whatever opportunities available to them. You literally left your family behind on another continent to come here and figure this thing out. And, you know, my hat's off to you for that. Thanks, nice, um, So grateful for you sharing with us on your first podcast interview. Really hope you enjoyed it. I think it was great value for the listeners. And to the listeners, your dreams should be real. We'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you for joining the tribe today. We would love to hear from you. Please don't forget to rate, like, and share. Perhaps someone you know could benefit from what we've discussed. Until the next time, remember that your dreams should be real.